welcome everybody again to our um, Baseball for All's very last live Q&A of the series. Um, I'm Lena Park and I head up the media content and some of the programming aspects for Baseball for All and I'll be your moderator today. Um, you know, this is our very last Q&A and we thought it would be fitting to end with the woman who started it all um, for us. And that's the one and only Justine Siebel. Um, you guys all know Justine as the founder of Baseball for All, um, but she's been blazing a path for girls and women in baseball for decades now. Um, she's the first woman, for, for those of you guys who don't know, she's the first woman to ever coach a men's professional baseball team which was with the Brockton Rocks in 2009. Um, and then from there, she's also the, uh, just two years later, she was the first woman to throw BP for an MLB team, which I just found this out today too, which was six different teams. It was the Indians, Rays, Cardinals, Astros, A's, and Mets, Rays and A's. Um, and then from there, she was the first woman to be hired for an MLB team, which was in 2015 when she took a coaching role with the Oakland A's during Instructional League in Arizona. And fun fact for those of you guys who don't know, that jersey is actually now hanging in the Baseball Hall of Fame also. Um, she's also coached around the world with Team Israel, with several teams in Mexico, South Korea, Japan, and beyond. Um, you know, now she's focusing her efforts on baseball for all and providing more opportunities for the next generation of girls and women, just like you guys, um, leading the way to help pursue their own, pursue your own dreams of playing, coaching, and leading in baseball. Um, she's the woman behind it all, and we're all so happy that you're joining us today, Justine. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Thank you. I'm very nervous. <laughs> it's been quite a lineup that we've had with this Zoom webinar, so I'm um, very excited to be with you and. Um, Happy to share my story. Absolutely. And I mean, it, don't be nervous. I mean, there's, there's all these happy, friendly faces that you all, that you all know. Um, so it's like a little family reunion right now. Um, so yeah, uh, we will just go ahead and dive in and get started. Um, the first one's gonna come from one of our junior captains, Kate, who is from Southern California. Kate, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name's Kate. I'm 13 from Chile, California. Was there any pressure on you for making an all-girls baseball organization? Yeah, amazingly, um, not everyone was for it. And so I would get emails that, you know, were not very kind or, you know, I, I was called a devil by somebody. So, <laughs> um, But I've had much more support for girls playing baseball. So uh, it's been very exciting that since Baseball for All uh, started that MLB has now gotten involved uh, with their events. So it, it really proved that there was a lot of girls out there who wanted to play baseball with other girls. And I knew that that was the case. So it was hard in the beginning, but it's not as hard now. Everyone gets it. All right, thank you, Justin. Cool. Uh, the next question is going to be coming from um, Leah, who's also 13. Go ahead, Leah. Go ahead, Leah. Um, first, I just want to thank you for everything you do for all of us. Um, where was the view for girls in baseball when baseball for all started, and where is it now? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, at the, so I started 20 years ago by putting together a girls baseball team that played in Cooperstown at Dreams Park. So I think that's really important is the first thing I thought about was, because in the US there wasn't any girls programs except for in Pawtucket with the Slaterettes, but they didn't have any interest beyond going past their town. So I thought, you know, what if I started a girls baseball team and then we played the boys? And if we're gonna play the boys, why not in Cooperstown? So it started with a girls team, and then I realized that if I could start a team, then I could teach another parent how to start a team, and another community how to start a team. And that's why in 2015, we held the very first national girls baseball tournament uh, for girls who are 13 and under. So it, I wanted it to go from more than just one team playing the boys to girls getting a chance to play with other girls. Um, and so that's kind of where we are now. We run girls baseball events. We support 
co-ed baseball, which most of you guys play with the guys as well. And um, like I said, it was a huge deal for MLB to get involved. I probably spoke to them for eight to 10 years before they finally decided to jump in. So um, I'm so excited about what they're doing. Thank you. Good question, Leah. Um, the next one's gonna be coming from Joe, uh, who's from New York. Go ahead, Josephine. Um, hi, Justine. Um, I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on the current MLB situation um, where there's like arguments between players and coaches about pay leave and stuff like that? Yeah, I like to stay fairly neutral with MLB things, you know, just because it's better for baseball for all. Um, but I, I hope they figure it out and there's a season. People want to play. Uh, people want to watch them play. The players want to play. But the players also want to make sure that their families are safe. So I think that's really important that they're people first, you know, and, and players second. And, but I do think we're going to play. We're going to see baseball this season. Thank you. Um, all right, our next question is going to be coming from um, Sarah, who's from Quebec. A little bit of a different question. Go ahead, Sarah. So, uh, hi, I'm Sarah Beaulieu from Quebec. And my question is, uh, do you think there will be a collegiate women league soon? And what would it take to, to, to make it? Uh, is it the number of university, uh, the number of girls, that's not enough, or the number of teams? Sure, that's a good question. So Canada is a bit different than the U.S., uh, being that the U.S. is very scholarship driven versus in Canada, they don't have those kinds of scholarships. So I think Canada has been more friendly to women who play baseball. Um, I can tell you that Baseball for All has a plan to try to grow uh, baseball at the college level, first with clubs. So if you're a college student, you could start a club and then we would help you make that schedule, help you get your uniforms, and um, then you could play one another. And once we do that, once we have about 12 to 14 teams, you know, in a certain area, then we can start talking about making it an official uh, college sport. But that's all how ice hockey started, bowling, is that they had this first show that there was a demand and that it's possible, and then the NCAA took them in. So it's definitely on my radar because I know you all want to play college baseball. And you can right now, with uh, many colleges will take our, uh, a woman, but I know that you would love to see college women's baseball, and so would I. So I definitely think that's going to happen. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Good question, Sarah. Um, our next question is going to be coming from Olivia, who's from um, New York also. And just a reminder, you guys, I know that Justine knows a lot of you, um, but just uh, – Reminder of how old you are and things like that too, um, just in case. Go ahead, Olivia. Um, hi, I'm Olivia and I'm 16 years old. So my question for you, Justine, is um, if you could go back in time, what would you do? Would you do anything differently? Or if not, then what advice would you give to your younger self? I go back in time as a player? I'm just, yeah. Okay, so I, like I was making the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say my first decision came when I was 13, because that's when I was first told I should quit baseball, uh, because I was a girl. And I decided not to quit and to keep playing. So it was much more difficult. You know, honestly, there's two things I would do. One, I realized I would be less shy. So I would, I would say that, uh, Boys aren't as scary as you think they are, or at least I thought they were. You know, I, had, uh, I was pretty shy in the dugout, and I didn't think I needed to be. So I, I would love to have the confidence I have now, put that back in my 14-year-old self. And then the other is I put so much pressure as the only girl. So they think I'm the first girl to play high school baseball in my state. And of course, like you, I was always the only one in my league. And I just felt like every time I struck out, like I failed all girls, <laughs> which is just not fun. And it's also just not true. So 
we can't play like that anymore. You know, I always tell girls, you can't play with that kind of pressure. You can only do the best you can represent, you know, the best you can with your hustle. All you can really control is how hard you work. So um, those are sort of the two things. One is to be a little less shy, realize that people aren't as scary as I thought they were. And uh, to, um, you know, don't, don't wear it all on your shoulders, have some fun. Okay, thank you. It's definitely, uh, from the question before, is that it's definitely possible for girls to um, play collegiate baseball, especially because I got um, at least one offer from like a local city school. So it's definitely possible. Yep, congratulations. And we are getting some coaches asking us, are there any uh, young women who want to play at college? So keep going after that dream if that's what you want to do. Thank you. Nice job, Olivia. And yeah, I mean, um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know um, or who don't follow us on social, you know, there are young women who are playing college baseball right now at the D3 and um, NC, NCJA level. Um, uh, there, there are a couple women that are doing that right now. So definitely, if you're interested in playing college baseball, um, it's yeah and um oz sailors are a mem board member of baseball for all she didn't just play college baseball she was captain of the team so can definitely be done for sure um okay our next question is going to be coming from alexia who is from ohio alexia go ahead my question is why did you want to be a general manager for the like the boys team yeah i wanted to coach um, I decided when I was 16 that I wanted to become a baseball coach and coach at the college level. And um, it's because I loved the game so much and I realized I wasn't going to play professionally uh, with the men, but I thought, hey, I could become a coach. So at 16, I started, you know, coaching at kids camps and, and working my way. And I got a PhD in sports psychology to sort of help me uh, qualify. I call it a tool in my toolbox, education. So for me, it was first because I loved the game. But now, as I grew older, it was really because I love helping people reach their goals. And I love working as a team. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Alexia. Um, the next one's going to be coming from Rosie from Chicago. Rosie? Hi, I'm Rosie. Um, since you were told that you couldn't put play baseball at such a young age how did you handle it and did you still have passion for baseball when you after yeah um how did I handle it well I did take a lot of pressure and I put it on my shoulders but mostly I just didn't quit I mean I was someone who slept with my bat next to my bed because I'd wake up and want to swing you know Friday night you'd see me at the batting cage my favorite time of the week was going to my pitching lesson um so I remember the times when I really loved the game and that that helped me when there were some really bad parts. You know, my best friend, one of my good friends, I wouldn't say best friend, but one of my good friends in high school, he was on the team. He said it was against God's way that I play baseball. And that's from my friend. <laughs> so you got to wonder what everyone else was thinking. Um, but when you're determined, the only person who can tell you to quit is yourself. You know, I didn't have to follow anybody else. I just had to keep finding another way through the wall. I love, all the I love all the everyone's wearing. I, thanks for everyone who came out with their BFA gear or their events. It's awesome. It's girls events. I'm going to represent you guys. Um, the next one's going to be coming from Meredith down in Florida. Meredith, you're on. I'm Meredith. I'm 12. What pushed you to start Baseball for All, and did you ever doubt that it would evolve into what it is today? Um, that's a good question. So the first thing I did was, well, I had my daughter, Jasmine, who was going to be on this call, but then she decided to get her bike fixed instead. <laughs> but uh, I had my daughter, Jasmine, when I was 23, and I was still in college. And when I looked at her, she's just a little baby. I mean, I remember the moment like it was yesterday. And I thought, if she wants to play baseball, I want to make it possible. And I don't want her to have to fight for it and face the discrimination that I faced. 
So I started thinking, how can I start something better for the future? And I first started a women's baseball league in Cleveland. And then I tried a semi-pro women's baseball team. And then I realized really the future's in the girls. And that's when I decided to start the Sparks, which was the 12 U team that went to Cooperstown Dreams Park and went for 13 years. But from there, I decided that, um, again, I didn't want it to be just about 12 girls playing baseball. I wanted to build leagues. I wanted to build programs so that more girls could play. And I just, it was hard, but I knew that if people could see your joy, like when you come to nationals, you know what everybody, all these adults tell me, you know, oh my gosh, these girls love baseball and they try so hard and they work hard and you can see they love it. And to me, I'm like, yeah, of course, <laughs> they're baseball players. But I knew that if other people could see that joy um, and that love that people would say, yes, baseball for all, let's do it. And, and that's what you see happening. Thanks for your question, Meredith. Um, the, ne the next question is coming from Paris, who's from Sweden. Um, go ahead, Paris. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Paris Brunessi. I'm 16, and I'm a player uh, who's going into her senior year next year, uh, and I'm looking at colleges right now. But I'm thinking, how did you start your career, even though it's, you know, as a coach and there's a difference between being a coach and a player, uh, how did you start your career? As a player? Yes. Okay. First, what time is it in Sweden? It is uh, 20 past one in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Did you go to sleep or did you just stay up? <laughs> I just stay up. Yeah, you just stay up. I'm in bed at night. <laughs> um, first, um, I, you know, um, the European Baseball Council used to have a rule that girls could not play baseball past the age of 15. And France, their national team, had a girl who shortstop. She was shortstop. So in one year, she was not going to be allowed to play anymore, not because of her ability, but because of her age. And so the French Baseball Federation flew me to France, and I, I made the plea that girls should be out, allowed to keep playing. They changed the rule. Uh, you know, may have heard of Melissa Mayu, who is the first woman to be um, in the international, MLB's international draft. Um, and then once France made the change, the European Union changed so that girls could keep playing. Thank goodness. So it's very exciting for me to see someone who's actually now uh, playing in Sweden and is part of that, that European Council. Um, I started playing t-ball. So like a little kid, I was just a little tiny kid. And I just kept playing baseball in my neighborhood on the leagues. And then I went uh, and I played high school. At first, my high school wouldn't let me play. And then I pitched against them at a camp. And when I pitched against them, I did so well. I uh, hit, it was the third, fourth, and fifth batter. And none of them got on base, and the ball didn't leave the infield. So when I went back to them, I said, can I try out? And they said, yes. So <laughs> it's never been easy. And then I specifically chose a college where, you know, everyone was allowed to play, except for when I got there, they decided that they ran out of uniforms, which is really sad. But and I didn't know then I could fight for my rights. Um, now I know. And now we help girls all the time fight for their rights at their school. Um, so I played in men's leagues. I played in a lot of men's leagues. I was often the first woman to play, but um, I was a pitcher mostly. And then I did get to play some women's baseball, uh, on which I, w I pitched and, and caught. I was a catcher. So, and in high school, I was third base in pitching. So I just started like a little kid. I had no idea it would be my whole life. Did, did that answer your question, Paris? Uh, yeah. And, but uh, when you did play, like, uh, even after 
uh, they let you into the high school and whatnot. Uh, was there was there still a lot of like hesitation and opposition because uh, uh, I me mean, I went to Sweden Academy here in Sweden and the coach basically tried to like prevent me from even trying out like I didn't get to go to the tryouts until we threatened to go to the principal uh, and uh, get like the law involved so. I'm sorry you had that experience. And that was my first experience, which was a no. Um, but then I left and went to another high school that let me play. And then I went back to that first high school where they let me play because they saw me. And they saw me pitch. So it was difficult. Every time I wanted to play after the age of 13, I was told no. Except for when I went to uh, Brewster Academy, which is a boarding school. That's the only place I've ever gone since where I didn't have to fight to play. But um, I don't know. I wasn't willing to quit, and I love the game. So good for you for keep going. Thank you. Thanks, Paris. And thanks for joining us at 1 in the morning. <laughs> um, the next question is going to be coming from Olivia, who is in Oregon. Go ahead, Olivia. Hey. Um, I'm Olivia and I'm 16 and my question was like you've traveled a ton through baseball and so what is like a beginner step to be able to travel to all these different places being a part of baseball like in any way whether it's like playing or coaching or whatever. Get your passport ready. Uh, first you know baseball for all is going to be doing more international leadership trips. Uh, we have taken a team to Mexico, South Korea, of course, uh, Canada. Um, so we're, we're looking to have more of those type of opportunities. I was very fortunate that, you know, I got to see the world through baseball. Um, and I think, I, I think that because I was always offering to help, that, you know, I would, I would ask a federation, you know, do you need help? In Mexico, they didn't have girls baseball. And a mother contacted me and said, hey, we want to start it. How can we do it? And I said, well, we'll bring a team down there. You create a tournament. And that media around our team and the tournament will help you start baseball. And sure enough, they now have a national team. Um, I also was the head of the uh, World Baseball Softball Confederation, the Women's Commission, for about eight years. So one of the most incredible moments of, of mine baseball career is getting to speak to a hundred baseball federations from around the world and tell them how important it is that they start girls and women's baseball programs. And many countries started them. And not only that, they would come back to me when I would see them two years later and say, Hey, we started a team, we started a program. This is how it's going. You know? So I've, I've been very uh, blessed to get to go around the world. And, and I think you can too offer your help. Follow baseball for all. I promise we'll do some international trips and uh, we'll get you seeing all the cool things that are out there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Liv. Um, the next question is going to be coming from Hannah from Arizona. Hannah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Hannah and I'm 13 and, I'm, and I just wanted to say thank you, but um, what are your future goals for baseball for all? I think you can you know, our goal, we do have a board of directors. Um, our goal is to continue to make more events. So there's more tournaments that you can play in throughout the weekend. Uh, we'd love to see league play. We'd love to see, um, you know, every other weekend, every weekend you have a place to go and play baseball, just like your brother might. Um, college baseball is big on our list. How can we start college baseball? And then, um, you know, expanding our leadership program. We have a, a captain's program and a junior captain's program. And this year we had to turn down 15 girls who wanted to be a part of that leadership program, which was heartbreaking for me. And so we want to be able to fundraise and expand our, our staff so that we can actually include not just those 15 girls, but get more and more girls in the leadership program. So I would say more events, more teams, uh, college baseball and more uh, staff so we can continue to expand and have the leadership program. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, next up is Yaz from Massachusetts. Go ahead, Yaz. Hi, I'm Yaz. I'm 13. And what field would you recommend getting an education in to be successful for coaching at a high level? See, Yaz just wrote a paper on me, which is very humbling for her school. Uh, so we chatted for about a half an hour. Um, I think that it just, depending on what you want to do with coaching, anything in bio, biomechanics, like kinesiology, math, um, I, would, I personally would stay away from sport management and, and be more specific. Um, you can still do business and do all your internships with minor league teams. Um, what you want to do is make yourself different. And I say, stay, I say, you know, shy away from sport management only because there's thousands of people graduating with that degree. So the way you can make yourself different is have a kind of a different degree or work through that time with the internships. Um, also have a minor in math. Everyone wants analytics. Everyone wants biomechanics. And I don't see that changing for a while. But you should definitely pursue what you're passionate about, you know. I didn't, I never knew I would be where I am today, but I did have a general goal, you know, around baseball, around helping girls and, and you know, here we are. Thank you. Justine, do you also want to mention what your degrees are in? Oh, uh, my uh, college degree, I created it. So it was leadership within the military, religion and baseball. And I used psychology to study how leadership changes between wartime, um, nonviolent protests like Martin Luther King, and then baseball. And then my master's degree was in sports studies where I uh, you know, learned how to do press releases and marketing and the philosophy sport. And then I got my PhD in sports psychology where I learned a lot about mental performance as well as you know, what is healthy youth sports. And so I went to school for like 11 years after high school to get all that done. But it was a goal I had since I was 16. And I knew if I wanted to coach professionally, I would have to have something the other men didn't. And in my case, I decided that would be education. Most men don't have PhDs to coach baseball. Cool. Uh, the next one. The next question is going to be coming from Elsa, who's also from Southern California, just like Justine. Go ahead, Elsa. Hi, I'm 11, and my question was, what was it like to start this kind of organization for girls to play baseball? It was a lot of hard work. <laughs> it was a lot of hard work. Um, I learned a lot of, about leadership about, I made many mistakes um, about how to work with other people and identifying like how board members, why they want to be on a board, what motivates them, learning how to communicate effectively. Um, but all of it's worth it because I get to see you girls. I mean, none of this would be worth it if, if the end hadn't been you. Um, it was, you know, to, to have all the pain and difficulty that I've gone through and then to see you, you girls go on the field and get to just let your hair down, so to speak, and play baseball and not be the girl and just have all these teammates that love you and you're friends with. I mean, that's what makes it worth it. Thank you. And you're 11. So I'm going to embarrass my friend because I have a friend on this call who I met when I was 11. And we're still friends. So Dee Dee, where are you? Say hello to everybody. She might be on mute. Yeah, she has to get <laughs> off. Where are you? I can't see you. Oh, I'm here. Oh God, you want my video too? Yes, they want to know that they'll be friends with these girls. They're friends now, later, there. See? Hey guys. You never know who's going to be your friend for life when you're 11 years old. Yeah. So, thanks, Dee, for being on. We had a paper route. We both oh had up five thirty in the morning when we were when we were in middle school and delivered the paper. We were not morning people, but we had 
paper routes. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You know, it's been great to see you, Justine, to like to know you for all these years and to watch you just continually go after your goal. And I often think about your your phrase there that when you tell your daughters that they can't play baseball, what else are you telling them they can't do? And <clears throat> I never wanted to play baseball, so it was okay that I that, that wasn't allowed for me. But you know, it really applies to other other aspects of life anytime you tell someone they can't say no um what else are you telling them no to so it has been outstanding to watch you follow your dream and and fight through these walls that you keep running up against over time and and to see you here today it's pretty awesome thank you so you see you can only get through it with your friends you know yeah. you're no longer alone and that was something that was really important with baseball for all. I started because I felt alone. When I was your age, I felt alone like no one else in the world playing baseball. I was the only girl. And now you know you're not alone, so now you have all these friends to stay with. And we have found that girls are staying in baseball longer because of the friends they've made through baseball for all. Thanks for joining us, Dee. Um, the next question is be coming from Tori, who's from Connecticut. Go ahead, Tori. Hi, I'm Tori, I'm 16, and um, I wanted to know, what is the biggest psychological struggle or problem that you face um, throughout your whole entire experience with baseball, whether it's playing or whatever it may be, and what do you recommend to help, like, push through any psychological struggles or, um, like, confidence downs or anything like that to get through? Okay, that's a hard question. I would say the most difficult part was everyone saying no. You know, not being able, being told no without even being able to show my skill was really hard. And it's still hard. I can still interview for a pro coaching job and have them not ask me an actual baseball question about pitching or something like that. Because they're, you know, still hung up on that I'm a woman. Um, but I think I've gotten through it because, well, when I was young, because I was just stubborn and determined. And, and the more someone said you couldn't do it, the more I loved baseball, the harder I was gonna work. And I think as I've gotten older and as I started Baseball for All, um, having my daughter, knowing that everything is bigger than me, um, you know, knowing that, um, that when I coach, professionally, when I break that barrier, there's five women who are coaching, who've coached professional baseball this year. I mean, you know, I was the one who like hit my head against the wall. I hit my head, hit my head, hit my head, made a crack and it's finally open. And, and that's what it's about. It's always a bigger picture. So when I feel really down, I always think about, you know, making a better opportunity for, for a 15 year old. I've always thought about that 15 year old who wants to move up from a coaching standpoint and for that 11 year old who's being told she should quit. Um, you know, that's what motivates me today. You guys motivate me today. Absolutely. And, and Lena will tell you that <laughs> because some days are really hard, but it's all about the girls and your future. That's very true. We would not be here obviously without you guys. We're, we all feel so lucky um, to have you guys and to, see how passionate you guys are for the game. Um, that's what keeps us going for sure. Um, thanks for your question, Tori. Uh, the next question is gonna be coming from Caitlin, who I believe is from Arizona. Caitlin? Hi. Okay, so uh, I'm currently reading this book called Out of Left Field. Uh, it talks about the challenges of um, um, woman in the 1950s playing baseball and the challenges they face. Uh, what are the challenges that uh, you see for women that want to play professional baseball? No. Now. <laughs> Always helpful to have a parent over there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the challenges are, well, first, there's no women's pro league. And there should definitely be a pro baseball league. As much as I'd love to see a woman playing in the majors. I think it's first we have to make sure that nine-year-olds 
are being given the opportunity to play in their youth leagues. Because if it's that hard for girls to play, you know, how do you expect the mass amount of girls to come up and be eligible to play pro baseball? So I think we need more girls playing. We need more developmental opportunities like college baseball. And um, I, I don't see a reason why a, a woman can't play professionally now with men, um, especially as a pitcher, because as a pitcher, your whole job is deception, which means that you have to change speeds, change location, change your pitch, and all of those things are possible. So um, it, you don't, it helps to throw 95, but you don't have to. You just have to get the batter off balance and keep them guessing. So I am sure there will be a women's pro league in your lifetime. And hopefully by the time you turn 25. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Caitlin. Um, our next question is going to be coming from... Sorry, one second. Um, is going to be coming from Rebecca, who's from Georgia. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm 16. You know me. Um, and I was wondering, as girls baseball is developing on a local level, like in city areas and towns where there's enough interest to start girls teams but not where there's some girls but not enough for a league especially in areas where there's not enough space for there's not the financial resources to travel every weekend um do you think it's better for girls to be playing all of the girls on one team against the guys teams or to especially i'm thinking like at the little league level here or to have some girls on each team to sort of normalize the concept to the boys as well? Sure, I've never been asked that question. Um, but I would say that league should, should put the girls on one team when they're like six and seven. You know, get them through that hump so they don't leave for softball and let them get their orange slices and ice cream. Um, and then I would love to see more co-ed teams as they get older. So I would like to see more of those girls stay in the game. So if you had a whole team of girls at 10 or 20, and then you can distribute them around. So it's more co-ed baseball, and you'll see the climate change, the environment change. And I think that um, those girls will be really welcomed. And to be honest, I have a small secret, which is that I would love to see baseball for all one day do a co-ed tournament in which the boys and the girls play together, because I think that's ultimately what kind of girls want. It's just to be respected. Um, girls baseball is important, but I think the co-ed could also have its own learning lessons as well. That is interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. I don't know how to respond to <laughs> Is that a bad answer? <laughs> no, I just, well, I wanted, your opinion and I got it. And that's interesting. That's the point, right? I think co-ed sports is really effective, but I think uh, you have to remember when I was a kid, I was the only girl playing on my soccer team. And um, once they started girls soccer, more girls played soccer. And that's why it's so important to have girls baseball because more girls will play baseball. Some girls won't care and will always play co-ed baseball. Just like I would have played co-ed soccer forever. But a lot of girls won't stay in the game if they're not getting a chance to play with other girls. Plus, you need girls baseball to get into the college and the Olympics and so on to move forward. So the question, so the answer is yes and. <laughs> all right, that'll be your dissertation. <laughs> um, all right, the next, the next one up is going to be Olivia, who, well, Olivia's on today. Olivia, who's from Northern California. Olivia, you still there? Yeah. Um, so my question is, what was the lowest point or hardest point of learning overall, and how did you grow or learn from it? Or both? Um, it's a good question. You're asking me what my lowest point was, right? Um, as a player, I feel that I just kind of kept going 
resilience wise. Um, there was a moment when I quit. For one day I quit baseball and I walked over to the softball team because the softball coach was constantly asking me to play. And there was, um, the baseball coaches couldn't decide what kind of role I should play. One was telling me to be a leader. Then I became, then I tried to do something that where I was a leader and tried to motivate the players. And then the other coach told me to stop talking and that I was wrong or something like that. And so one coach was yelling at me to do this. Another coach was yelling at me to do this. And I just walked away. Um, and I was 17 and I just went and sat on the softball, the, the bench. Um, that was probably the lowest point as a player. But then the next day, you know, you sleep on it and I wasn't going to quit baseball. But that was, that was a moment where I, I, I didn't know what to do anymore. Like I'd finally gotten on the field, but the adults were arguing over me. And I felt like I was in a no win zone. And, and I momentarily just kind of, couldn't handle it. But there's always the next day. It's the one thing that's always good. There's always another day where you get to start over. Awesome. Thanks for your thanks for your question, Olivia. Um, the next question is going to be coming from Ashlyn, who's from Canada. Ashlyn, go ahead. Oh, I got you, Ashlyn. Go ahead. Oh, um, what was your best experience in your career? Say that again. What was your best moment in your career? My best moment in my career? Well, having my daughter is the best thing that ever happened to me. It's, it's the most thing, it's, I'm the most proud of having my daughter and having her grow up to be an empathetic, hardworking, kind person. Um, but coaching for the A's, that was it, right? You walk in and you've got your jersey and your number and your locker and you're surrounded by baseball players and coaches. And then for that to go in the Hall of Fame, I mean, baseball wise, it doesn't really get better than that. When we had our first nationals with the girls, I had to fight back the tears while I was doing the announcing with the parade. So you have to see all these girls who wanted to play baseball. Um, that was incredibly touching. Thanks, Ashlyn. A nice hat, Ashlyn. <laughs> all right, the next question is going to be coming from Bryn, who I believe plays for the Bay Sox. Go ahead, Bryn. Were you ever put down for wanting to support girls in a mostly boy-played game? Yes. I was put down as a player. I was spit on. I was thrown at. Um, and then as an adult, when I was trying to start baseball for all, even during baseball for all, I've had a lot of kickback of people, um, one, thinking they could do it better, and so they went off and tried to do something um, or two, just complete strangers telling me that it was, you know, immoral uh, for me to help girls play baseball when girls should be playing softball. But um, you can't let the bad guys win. It's kind of my philosophy. Thank you. Thanks, Bryn. Um, our next question is going to be coming from Alice from the DC area. I think it's DC, right? Or Maryland? DC, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for doing this, Justine, and for all you do. Um, my question was like, what was the most challenging part of starting BFA? I didn't expect the adults to fight so much. I'd <laughs> say, I thought that everyone would be on the same page. Let's get all girls playing baseball. And I found that not everyone agreed with that. And so I think we've had baseball for all only exists because your coaches volunteer their time. The amount of time your coaches, for example, in DC, the amount of time that Ava or your mother puts in um, is why baseball for all exists. And so we now have enough adults who understand that it's about all girls playing. And it's not just about making an all-star team or it's about, um, 
you know, their daughter getting to play shortstop. It's about the whole picture. It's about the next generation. So the hardest part was kind of getting the right adults together who understood the mission that I was trying to do. And my mission was that all girls could get to play. And you didn't have to be an all-star to play this game. And so that's what Baseball for All is founded on. Every girl gets a chance to play. And even if she doesn't play, let's find a, let's find a rule for her on the team. Thank you. And I think, guys, if, you, if, you, if you're on your computers and you can scroll through, you can see not just, you know, coaches who are full adults, <laughs> but you can also see people that are on here that have come back and coached with been players. Like, I see Tori on this call. I see Beth on this call. I see Gabby on this call. I see a ton of people on this call who used to play for Baseball for All, and now they've graduated, um, and they're coming back, and they're coaching for – for you guys, they're coming back for the next group of girls. So um, let, me, let me build off what Lena's saying. Tori, wave your hand, say hi. Hi, my name's Tori. So Tori is one of my favorite, my, Tori is exactly what baseball for all is. And I'll tell you that what happened is I, I was in New York City for work. So often when I travel for work, I try to do something for girls baseball. And we decided to get all of the New York parents together. And, and we could start a company, not a company, but an organization. And Tori was older than everyone else. And she said, she sat at that table with a bunch of adults and she said, I don't care if I don't get to play. I want to make sure that the girls younger than me get their chance. And if there's anything more baseball for all, I don't know what it is. I mean, even just telling the story, I kind of choked up a little bit. Because that's what it's about. It's about giving back. And Tori, at a young age, had that as a high schooler had that perspective. And now New York Wonders is like, I don't know, you send like 60 people to nationals, 40 people, and you've run the Maria Pepe event. So it, that's baseball for all, if you wanna know. Creating leaders, helping girls empower other girls. You know, it's very exciting to me. So thank you, Tori. Absolutely. Thank you, Justine. <laughs> Um, the next question is going to be coming from, um, let's see here. Uh, we're actually going to be circling back to Ella. Go ahead, Ella. Hi, I'm Ella. I'm 13. I'm from Hawaii. Uh, my question was, does Baseball for All have a relationship with Japanese women's baseball? Because um, I want would potentially like to attend college in Japan and I was wondering if I would be able to play in play baseball in Japan. Yeah so I was a guest pro coach in Japan last summer and we I went and met with the league and so we did build a relationship of sorts and we sent Oz Sailors there our board member um, and she was able to play for a couple weeks with their like V program. They weren't ready to accept an American in the whole league, but they were willing to like start that relationship and go from there. So we knew Oz would be a great ambassador. And so we sent her. Um, so I think uh, by the time you are playing, that would be a real possibility and uh, we can make a connection for you. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> excuse me. Thanks, Ella. Um, I know we've only got a couple more minutes, uh, but uh, we'll just keep on trucking through. We got a question coming from Christina, who is um, from the East Bay, California. Christina, go ahead. Or Pat, I don't know if Christina's there. Christina has gone off to eat. Um, I'm a, I, I don't know if this will help, Justine, but for all the girls to know from the first nationals in Orlando, how many girls came together to how many girls would have came together this summer? Sure. So, Just to give them a picture of numbers of growth of what they're involved in, the movement they're involved in. Yes, so that's a good question. So the first nationals in 2015, there were no girls teams besides Pa Tuckett who wasn't looking to participate. There was no girls baseball teams in the U.S. So um, a select few like um, 
Alex Oldby and, and Rocky Henley and, um, from Bay Sox were willing to start a team and they understood the concept. So we got 11 new teams, brand new teams from the US and put them together. The 12th team was from Canada. And then, um, so 12, thir 12 teams of 13 you played. And then we had like a little kid portion. So that's about 144 girls. Five years later, we were expecting 600 girls at this year's nationals. 600 girls. And next year, we can easily see that being 800 to 900 as we grow. Because you staying in baseball, you telling your friends about that girls playing baseball, you showing the boys that you're going to keep playing, um, it's all growing the game. And so the more events we can have, the more girls are going to play. And, and like, as Pat said, there was, there was 140 kids. And um, those girls are now, I believe, seniors this year. So it's pretty exciting. It is exciting. Thanks, thanks for your question, Pat slash Christina. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to circle back. I, I know that um, Joe had a lot of good questions. Joe, do you want to go ahead and ask another one of yours? Um, yeah. So uh, you had just said that, like, um, in the U.S. – oh, by the way, I'm 15. I'm from New York City, and thank you for everything you've done for me and my teammates. Um, I was wondering, as you just said, there is, like – or there was – I don't know if there still is um, – a lack of girls' baseball programs and recognition in the United States as compared to Canada. I know Australia has its own – um, like international program why do you think that is like why do you think there is a lack in the United States and how do you think identifying that problem will help us to as like a girls baseball community gain more recognition throughout the states so another dissertation for you you can write your senior paper on that it's a big topic um, the, the reason is that when Little League was sued to allow girls to play baseball, um, instead of allowing girls to play baseball, instead of supporting girls to play baseball with the boys, they started a softball program. And so girls started playing softball. And now we have the societal myth that girls play softball and boys play baseball. Um, even, even so, we've, you know, really worked on getting softball players to, you know, have more opportunities like in D1 and be on ESPN, just like the boys. In Canada and Australia, softball is not as big. So they're not fighting that softball culture. And that's why Baseball for All really thinks about that 10-year-old, that 11-year-old girl who has been told she can't play baseball. And we focus on that um, if, uh, instead of maybe that 5-year-old and being able to start from the beginning, um, which is really the best thing to do is to start from the very beginning. But I get too many emails from kid, girls being told they can't play that we're really focused on, you know, making sure those girls get to play. But I expect that when you're an adult, that you'll be able to have five-year-olds and six-year-olds in your league that you'll be coaching in. And they'll play baseball like it's no big deal. Just like today, how girls play soccer like it's no big deal. Thank you. Um, our next question is going to be coming from actually one of those people that we just uh, called out um, in a good way. Um, who's Gabby, Coach Gabby, um, who actually, for those of you guys who don't know, actually started her own um, girls baseball team and program um, in the New York City area also, the Reinas. Um, so if you guys don't follow them on social, you should. Um, but Gabby's got a question um, for just you. Well, Gabby, you want to go ahead? If Gabby's still here. We'll come, we'll come back to you. Now that I've hyped you up, um, we'll come back to you. Uh, um, I think our, one of our last questions is going to come from Olivia Lockhart. Go ahead, Olivia. Oh, Olivia, I think you're on mute if you're talking right now. Yep, go ahead, Olivia. 
Okay, Olivia, I'll ask your question for you. Um, the question she has is, how do you feel when people tell you that girls can't play baseball? Um, I mean, I feel there's a, obviously a surge of frustration and anger, but also just like, you're an idiot. Girls are playing baseball. It's not a matter if girls can play baseball. Girls are playing baseball. So I kind of dismiss them. I, I'm obviously, I have a lot less anger now because we've already shown that girls are playing baseball. Um, but we can prove it. Over 100,000 girls are playing baseball. And we know we can continue that number all the way up. In fact, recreationally, there's over a million girls and women who are playing baseball who will pick up a glove and start throwing the ball around. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Justine, we're just about out of time. Is there anything else that you want to say to everybody who's here, who's tuned in for final BFA q and <laughs> I'd like, I'd like to end with a story, if that's okay. So when I was 20 years old, um, I went to Venezuela. Um, and one of the sports I played there was baseball. And we went up into this village up in the mountains where the kids ran around with no shoes. And our team went out there and we played a 15 year old team and, and we were like 19 and 20. And we just got crushed. Our, I mean, you can imagine the Venezuelans beating us. They had a baseball field. It was the smallest village, but they had this beautiful baseball field for the kids to play on. And I happened to pitch, and I pitched really well. I pitched one inning, and um, I struck out a guy. And so afterwards, a lot of people wanted to come up and talk to me because it was the first time they'd ever seen a girl play. And at the end, as I was walking back to the bus, a father stopped me. And he said, my daughter asked if she could play baseball. And I told her no. But now that I've seen you play, I'm going to let her. And that was the moment I realized that my playing baseball could be bigger than myself. And that's what switched my thinking, that I could help others through a game that I love. And like Tori did, and like Gabby is, and like Justice, who's come back and helping a leader. All of you are capable of taking this game that you love with everything you have and making our world better. And I think helping someone else is really the greatest privilege you can have. And being a part of Baseball for All, being a part, being a part of you, your lives, seeing someone who's nine years old, who's now on Team USA, I mean, that's really what it's all about. And not just being on Team USA, but just growing up and becoming these incredible people who are like you, bold and willing to go after what you want and don't let anyone tell you no and that you're perfect as you are. Doesn't matter what clothes you wear or what your hair looks like or if you have makeup or if you play softball or if there's a bow in your hair, you're perfect as you are now. And that is what I want you to know. And at Baseball for All, we're a family. So whether you want to be or not, you're stuck with me. I expect some wedding invites, some college graduate parties. You know, I want to see you. I want to see you, all the amazing things you're going to do. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to Lena, who is amazing, running everything with Baseball for All, and for being a part of our webinars for this spring. Um, and hopefully some of you can come out to nationals here in December uh, in LA, and we'll keep playing. I know it's hard now, but we'll keep playing, I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justine, for everything that you do and for being with us today for this hour. Um, it, I think this was, I think this was really good. Um, and thank you to all of you guys who joined today. Um, this, this was, I know some of you guys have been on every single one and we really appreciate you being there for all 10 of these that we've done. Um, and for those of you who was, your, who was your first one, we still love you and um, are grateful that you were um, here with us. So, if you guys ever need anything um, baseball wise, uh, you know where to find us. Um, just reach out to us. Like Justine said, we're, we're a big baseball family. So um, reach out to us and we'll help you with whatever you guys need. So thanks for the thumbs up, Allie. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you guys so much. Stay safe. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you.